Chapter 3. Adieu. Pierre was in no hurry to get home. All his life he had been a thinker, not a doer, a boy who considered every possibility before making a decision. Today was the first time he'd ever done anything this impulsive. Now he was scared. If only he'd talked it over with his parents. He knew his father would be proud of his enrolling, but he was afraid to even think of facing his mother. Pierre paused by the company storehouse to look downriver. The lonely laughter of a loon echoed across the dark water. The loons traveled north and would be leaving, like him, any day now. And leaving with Pierre would be a lifetime of his mother's dreams. On the way home, Pierre passed Dr. Gilliard's house and hung his head. He was still ashamed of how he had handled the, inc the accident. It was nearly dark by the time Pierre arrived at his cabin. When Pierre finally opened the cabin door, he spotted his parents sitting at the kitchen table having tea. Except for the bandaged hand that rested on the table, father looked strong. You're home at last, mother rose to greet Pierre, but stopped when she saw the paper and the long twist of tobacco in his hands. Every spring, father marched proudly through the door with these same articles. Every long summer, mother waited for his brigade to return home. She stood, shocked, stock still, pressing one finger to her temple as she stared at her son. She didn't say anything, but her eyes showed disappointment. Pierre placed his engagement papers and tobacco ration on the plank table. Father stared at the document before him. He slowly began to grin. You've signed on? He rose from the table and embraced Pierre. My son, the voyager, he said proudly. When Pierre pulled out his salary advance and presented it to mother, tears welled up in her eyes. No, she protested. You must keep some for yourself. Pierre only shook his head, knowing that if he tried to speak, he would cry too. Later that evening, while they sat before the fire, Pierre's father asked his son about the men he'd met. He praised Char Charbonneau and La Petite as fair and dependable, frowning only when he heard the name of Belloit, the fellow who had teased Pierre. Jean Belloit is a scoundrel, father said, though as good a bowman as you'll find. But no matter who you're paired with, father added, be sure to pull your own weight, and most important of all, don't complain. There's no place for laggers or whiners among canoemen. Don't forget, either, that patience is your best friend in the North. You'll save many a, a carry by thinking your course through to the end. To the voyager, the route is everything. Father paused then and pulled deeply on his little clay pipe. Pierre listened carefully. I want you to know it is a good life if you make it so. When I was your age, I met a man at the fort in Salt St. Marie who claimed 50 years of service to the Hudson's Bay Company. One evening, he said to me, Charles, my whole life has been the canoes. Every river, every portage, every wife and song and sled dog that I knew was a pleasure. Perfect in itself. Were all my days given back to me, I would make no other choice than to be a voyager. Pierre nodded, firm in his decision and ready for the adventure. Long after Pierre had gone to bed, his mind whirled with pictures of the day. The giants, La Petite, the laughing faces of Charbonneau and Bellegarde, the evil sneer of, of Jean Beloit. When sleep came, Pierre dreamed he was paddling alone up a narrow rocky river. The current was so swift, he used all of his strength to keep the canoe from being swept downstream. He pulled hard until he came around the sharp bend. There, among, along the bank, as far as he could see, stood his classmates from school. Sister Marguerite's voice was in the background saying, A true gift for learning is rare, my boy. Think of what you could have become. A scholar, a lawyer, a... Just then there was a thunderous roar. A wall of water hit the bow, hit the bow, catapulting him into the river. Ah! 
Pierre yelled as the water swept over him, pushing him down, down. His body cartwheeled into the blackness. The icy water churned over him as he struggled to find a footing on the slippery rocks. When Pierre woke, he was tangled in his blankets and his heart was hammering in his throat. A moment later, the leather-hinged door of his parents' bedroom creaked. Pierre lay still. Mother whispered, Are you all right? He coughed. <clears throat> I'm fine. Are you sure? She stepped forward to touch his forehead. I thought I heard something. I'm all right. He fought to calm himself. His heart still pounded hard from his nightmare. Pierre lay awake for a long time after Mother left. Out his bedroom window, upstream, the sky was a wilderness of stars. He was floating in blue-black light, lost in the depths of the dark river. Pierre tried to think of gentler things, but he was haunted by his dream. And every time he closed his eyes, he felt as if he were lying at the bottom of a watery grave.